Hello, this is Strategy Miscellany, and this is the early morning launch of ComSat 1. So, three, two, one, ignition. So, I'm going to be placing this communication satellite, currently hidden under this fairing here for aerodynamics, into a polar orbit. And basically, it's in one part, kind of for role playing. It's in one part so that there's a wider angle around Kerbin where I can receive signals from. And it's for one part so that my polar research station, when I build that, can actually transmit data back to the science center. Because it can't transmit straight through the ground on the planet. So we have to build a satellite to basically bounce the signal. So once we get up to about 20 or 30,000 meters, I'll blow the fairing and let you take a look at what the inside of this looks like. And you can see with this mainsail engine, I've been able to make a much more simplified design than some of our previous rockets. Uh, it's just, you know, one big engine, one big lifter stack, and then the communication satellite itself will finish circularizing the orbit after the launching stack gets at 80 or 90 percent of the percent of the way there, and then it can thrust out to a wider orbit once I've done that. And I figure I'll put it maybe 10,000 kilometers up or so. Long way still, even from the lunar orbit, but wide enough that it provides that wider angle of view for communications back to Kerbin. So, starting to lean over here. out of the thick part of the atmosphere. Now I don't want the fairing to crash into the rest of the rockets and cause significant damage or anything. So I am waiting until the air gets very thin before I let go of it. And I also want to make sure I'm basically facing towards my velocity vector at the moment I let go of it too. Now, we do want to lean a little over this way to compensate for the rotation of Kerbin. You can see that island chain out there. There's a little airfield on that island. We should go visit that when we build an aeroplane. And all right, we're getting up high enough. Let's uh, decelerate a little bit, just to make sure we don't run into trouble here. And let's let go of that fairing. So you can see the clamshell pieces of the fairing come off. And we have a simple little communication satellite here. Probe core, bunch of relay antennae, solar panels on the top and the bottom. And it's time to start circularizing here. Alright, let's see what our status looks like. <clears throat> so, I will go ahead and skip ahead till we're in orbit, which shouldn't be too long. We have ComSat-1 now in a polar orbit with a radius of about 330 kilometers. You can see it here. And then the next step is we're going to widen out this orbit to our desired orbital altitude. And then we'll have to do a second burn at Aptoapsis to circularize. So let's see. That's about 4,000 clicks. All right, that's just about 10,000 kilometers. It's about 9.75, and I should have enough fuel to do both this and the circularization here. So let's go. I will get back to you when we are completing the circularization.
Coming back to ComSat-1, we now have it in a roughly circular orbit at about 9,750 kilometers above the surface of Kerbin. And going around the poles, you can see it here in a map of the whole system. And if I turn on the vessel links here, you can see it is currently able to communicate with my vessel on the moon and even very tenuously with my interplanetary launched vessel. Void Seeker 3. Uh, in the future, I'll build a full communication satellite network, but I kind of want to wait for better antennae before I build out a really full scale one. This is more part proof of concept and part so that when I build my polar research base, which is going to be our next step, it can actually phone home. So let's go back to the Space Center. And start a new craft. So we now have, as you can see here under utility, we now have the experiment control station, the goo monitor, and the weather analyzer, and a photovoltaic panel. And so I'm going to send some Kerbals out to the North Pole, or actually let's do the South Pole. Let's make it an Antarctic station. To the South Pole to basically set up a weather station down there. So we'll start with a pod here. We'll actually be bringing some scientists and engineers along. And I'll get back to you once we're ready for launch. So this is Polar Station 1. It's really quite simple. It's just a single stage here. And it'll take them on a suborbital trajectory. Then the capsule detaches and re-enters. It does have a little heat shield just in case. And then it lands with a drogue chute and a regular parachute. And then, uh, once it lands, Bill, who is a engineer, and Bob, who is a scientist, will get out and set up the scientific research base. Um, the ship will actually be piloted by this probe core here as neither Bill or Bob is a pilot and this capsule only fits two. Hopefully that won't cause us any problems. Let's go ahead and give it a go. Alright, so it's sunset at the Kerbal Space Center and we are getting ready to launch. It is three, two, one. This ship doesn't have enough delta V to get into orbit, but all we're doing is a suborbital hop. We only have to get about a quarter of the way around the planet. So that's why we're able to build this one so small. And once we get up a little ways, we'll start healing over to the south. Oops, towards the south. Now, hopefully not too long after you watch this, you can actually watch the Artemis 1 test flight. I believe it's currently scheduled for September 27th, and fingers crossed they actually get it to go off without a hitch this time. I know they've had trouble with fuel lines and things like that that Kerbal Space Program doesn't simulate. So, best wishes to NASA on that, and here's hoping we can watch that together end of this month.
Now, hopefully I actually gave this thing enough, um, enough Delta V to do its job. I might have shorted it a little bit. But it does still have a thousand meters in there, so I think it'll be okay. Alright, let's see what it looks like. Yeah, right now it's a bit short. But what if we accelerated about here? Okay, yeah, this is uh, not going to work. Let's see if with this delta V that I have left, I can actually get this to do a landing on the ground. Well, it doesn't look like it. I guess this will just be kind of a proof of concept. So as you can see, I unfortunately got cocky, built a rocket that doesn't have the capacity to actually fly all the way to the South Pole. So, Bill and Bob are going to have to do a water landing here. And unfortunately they're not allowed to set up their experiments in the water. So we'll have to recover the vessel and give it another try. Hopefully the re-entry shouldn't pose any problems at this kind of speed. Yeah, we're losing, you know, a tiny bit of a blader, but nothing really serious. You can see I only have limited crew control because the probe is blacked out by the plasma and the crew doesn't really know how to fly a spaceship. They can still sort of yank on the controls, they just can't do any advanced maneuvers or maintain stability very well. Yep, definitely coming down over the ocean at sunset. Pop the chutes, and I'll see you at the landing. All right, we're making a water landing at sunset, going down at about eight meters per second. A little fast, but nothing the capsule can't handle. And let's recover that and try something like that again. This time I'm sticking with the obvious solution of just bolt a big solid rocket booster on the bottom to give it a kick upwards to start. And three, two, one, ignition. So this guy should basically get us up into the high upper atmosphere, going pretty fast southwards, and then this one will complete the operation get us to a landing over the southern ice sheet on Kerbin. Uh, Kerbin doesn't have a southern continent the way the real world does, so it's just a sheet of ice like the North Pole. Kerbin also doesn't seem to have any issues with climate change. Apparently they don't want enough rockets for that to be an issue.
All right, getting up to 10,000 meters. Starting to heal over a little bit. It's interesting how as we get up higher, we start getting above the horizon and the sun starts being up again when it isn't up when you're at ground level. I suppose you might see that in the real world. Although, Kerbin is a lot smaller than the real world, so you get a more pronounced effect. The horizon is closer and all that sort of thing. Countering the sideways sideways velocity we get from the rotation of the planet. Oh, wrong direction there. Got a apparatus about above the atmosphere. Let's try a little planned maneuver here to make it down over the Antarctic, and ideally over the day side of the Antarctic. Something maybe like this would be good. All right, we're doing the burn for the transfer here. I will get back to you when we're re-entering atmosphere. So we've done the burn. We're soaring up and over Kerbin's southern oceans and preparing for re-entry. There is the southern ice sheet. All right, if possible, I'm going to do a bit of a deceleration burn here in the upper atmosphere to make our landing a little bit more gentle, or our re-entry a little bit more gentle. Drop that stage. The camera's a little weird because we're so near the pole. Now, thinking about it, too, the day-night cycle in the Kerbin polar regions is a little different than on Earth because Kerbin has zero axial tilt. So instead of having periods of permanent day and permanent night, the poles are in kind of a perpetual twilight where the sun is right on the horizon. And this area near the poles will have uh, perpetual, I believe, just 12 hour days. The day length won't change. It's just that the sun will be very low in the sky all the time, as opposed to at the equator where the sun can get that uh, high noon directly overhead. Here the sun's always going to be low in the sky, but the days stay the same length, unlike the radically different day-night cycles in summer and winter on Earth. Seems a little bit unstable in this configuration, probably because of those extra boxes bolted onto it. And our poor friends here are having to deal with some pretty heavy G-forces, but they should be getting through that pretty quickly. Yeah, there we go. They can hopefully start recovering now. Well, Bob here is not enjoying it. Yeah, they're doing better now.
All right, we can pop the chutes. Start heading for landing. I think that was our rocket stage hitting the ground. Pretty soon our drogue chute should take off. Fully open up. I believe it does that at 2,500 meters up. Oh, this is a nice image. I like the sort of gloomy nature of the clouds there. Very dramatic. Take off the heat shield. Get ready for the landing. Once the other parachute opens, this should be a little more stable. There we go. Turn on the SAS to kill the spin. And down we go. And here we are, landed on the southern ice sheet in its perpetual polar twilight. And we're going to have Bill the engineer get out and start setting up the basics of this research base here. So here we go. First thing we need is the core of the whole setup here. There it is, the experiment control station. Now, I didn't give the Kerbals their jetpacks, but he still can't quite fit this in his storage, it looks like. So I'll need to have him stow his parachute, too, now that we've landed. Now he can take the probe core, or the experiment core, he can take off his helmet. Well, it might be a bit chilly out. Do a little jump, fall flat on his face. And then you just press this button. Rotate there. It's interesting that it says J and, ah, J and L to rotate this way. I don't think I've done that before. Interesting. Place this part. It'll start setting itself up. But by itself, it won't work. It needs some solar power. Now, solar panels are more effective if they're set up by an engineer, especially a higher level engineer. So that's how two solar panels are going to power all three devices here. So we'll take the first solar. You can see he kind of straps it to his back. Put it facing the sun, of course. And it should unfold there in a second. There we go, it's turning to face the sun. And let's go get out the second solar. I don't want it shadowed by the first or anything, but here looks good. And then Bob can also take a surface sample. Well, I think we've done that before. But there's a little sample of some ice from the southern ice shelf. For when the recovery mission comes to pick up our intrepid Kerbonauts here.
Now we send out Bob the Scientist. Bob has to go stow his parachute now. He can hand it over to Bill. And now he can place these monitoring devices. One. I believe that's the weather station. Yeah, it's got a little antiometer and all that. Place the mystery goo monitor here. Wait for that to wake up. Got a little camera to watch what it does. And now if I look at the station here, it has the power, it has the communication signal, it has the experiments connected, and so it's very slowly giving us science. The Mystery Goo container gives us 0 0.02 science per hour. The Weather Analyzer gives us 0 0.02 science per hour. Also, every day or so it'll transmit a block of science back to our uh, home base until these reach 100%. On other planets, this actually produces quite a bit of science. This is more just kind of a proof of concept, and I think the little station looks cool here, kind of silhouetted against the silhouetted against the sun. I'm going to go ahead and speed up time so we can watch the sun move across the sky a little bit. Nice. And lastly, before we recover this vessel, uh, Bill has one last thing to do. So I brought along this little field science device here and Bill can do a little field science experiment here. It won't get as much as if we did this on another planet but it's kind of a proof of concept. So he's gonna hit a golf ball. This is a reference to one of the Apollo astronauts doing this I believe. Alright send him back to the capsule and we can recover the vessel and now if I run time forwards a bit we'll get a bit more science on this to see let me just watch that come in once. Alright, so you can see there where it tells me about the experiments being transferred from the surface. I think it's more like once a week or so that it actually does it. So it's not enough to research any more tech nodes or anything at this point. And I think that's actually a good place to stop for this episode. Um, we will go ahead and do the exploration of Minmus next episode. Definitely send a probe and probably send a crude lander in after the probe. But for now, uh, that's it. Thank you very much for watching and have a great day.